Okay, on to the next uh, topic, which is the fabulous Tasha Mellons Cohen. And again, I'm not going to read her biography, but just invite her to come right up here and give her presentation and take any questions if there's time at the end. Thank you, Tasha. Round of applause for welcome, Tasha. So, I'm going to start with Can You All Hear Me, which is the uh, traditional start to a presentation. I know some of you may be concerned that you're going to hear the same presentation that you might have heard at Alps from Gaynor. I promise you, this is different. Uh, I'm going to start with who we are, obviously, and uh, a little bit about our transformative framework, but then move into how it's been received, what the likely impacts of that will be on our OA distribution, and what's next. So, as always, about us. Uh, the Microbiology Society is a membership charity for anyone interested in microbes, their effects, their practical uses. As I'm sure you can imagine, we are rather busy at the moment with coronavirus or COVID-19. Uh, our membership is worldwide, academics, clinicians, and so on. Publishing for us is part of our strategic mission. Uh, we have remained an independent society publisher when many of our other society colleagues have partnered with a commercial entity. And that's given us a lot of flexibility and a lot of control over our own destiny. So we have six journals. You can see them up here. Uh, four are hybrids. I make no apologies for running hybrid journals. And two are pure open access. So... When considering our approaches to designing a mechanism that would allow us to work towards a transformation of our four hybrid journals in compliance with Plan S, we followed three key principles. The first of them was sustainability. So sustainability for us is not purely financial. We need to find a mechanism that will allow researchers around the world to continue to publish in our journals regardless of their funding status. So to put this in context, between 2016 and 2019, Europe, including the UK, accounted for significantly less than 30% of our corresponding authors. Plan S and pay to publish OA are not globally desired. We need to be sensitive to the nuances of different locations and different scenarios and different situations. Uh, to take just one example, for our single largest journal, 18% of authors, corresponding authors, that is, are from the Republic of Korea. They published nearly 600 articles in a four-year period, of which four were open access and those four were open access at the request of the editor-in-chief of the journal. None of them were paid for. Our second principle was simplicity. We have a charitable mission. We also have very limited resources. So in terms of Plan S compliance and transformative agreements, there's my colleague Gaynor and there's me. We can't do complex bespoke deals with every single party. So we coalesced on a very clear, very simple offering. Zero caps, so unlimited OA, unlimited read. One fee. We're not doing a complicated model where there's a read fee and a publish fee and a this and a that. It's just one fee. And six journals. We are not separating out our hybrids from our open access journals. We did not want to devalue the OA journals by excluding them from a deal but we also really needed to keep this super simple. And then our third principle was scalability. Sustainability is great, simplicity is great, complexity is always going to creep in. You can't do anything about it. So, as I said, we're a small team. In the last 18 months, we have had to tackle some really quite significant challenges including the expansion of our client engagement from authors, subscribers, and agents to include funder bodies, to include OA intermediaries, and critically to include consortia, who had previously said to us repeatedly and in no uncertain terms that we were far too small for them to be talking to. I'm very pleased that that is no longer the case. But having to adapt to playing with consortia in an 18-month period 
with two people, or one and a half people, when you've never done it before, that's a real game changer and it's been a challenge. Either way, putting our three principles together, what we came up with was publish and read. Frictionless, unlimited open access for all corresponding authors from any participating institution. Now, I know, because it came up in our session in the workshop just now, that many libraries would like our deal, and indeed all transformative deals, to cover all authors. We ran the maths on that, and with all due respect, we can't afford it. We can't afford it as the Microbiology Society, but we also don't think that the libraries can afford it as institutions. So, corresponding authors. Before going out to market, we did some market research, and AccuComs were very helpful with this. They, they did the phoning around for us. And while we had some fantastic and really positive feedback, we also had some librarians saying some slightly less pleasant things, like, we're very commercially naive because our offer is so much more generous than the one made by our commercial competitors. It's all you can eat rather than count. Some libraries said that this generosity meant that the model would be financially unsustainable for the society in the long term. Now, I know that some of you have read my paper. It's up in Insights. It's also on, uh, on, online as a preprint. I promise you we've done the maths on this. It is financially sustainable for us to make this offer. So pre-funded, unlimited open access, actually for us more sustainable than APCs. A second comment was about our green open access position. So for the last five years or so, the society has offered embargo-free green open access, author accepted version. Some librarians seem to suggest that because this was available, they saw no point in signing up to our publish and read deal. I was highly amused when the three people who, uh, who had actually made this particular comment had signed up before the end of 20, 2019. Um, we do appreciate that some institutions will choose the embargo-free green route. That's fine. This is just another option for them. And the third comment is kindly summarized here as act in haste, repent at leisure. Uh, some libraries felt that we were moving too quickly and that we should watch what the commercial publishers did and then follow their lead to avoid introducing more models and more complexity into the system. The reality for us is that we need to play catch up. Library budgets are flatlining, we know that, against a background where output in terms of numbers of articles published, numbers of books published and so on, is increasing. If we waited for the commercials to decide what the transformative model should be, there would be no space for us in the market. By creating an offer that retains a slice of the institutional pie, we ensure the future of the society, at least for the moment. Okay, we're not having any joy with the clicker. There we go. With the plans in place, and despite the sometimes negative feedback, uh, we went to our trustees and they approved setting up publish and read deals for 2020. So we started working through various channels to make this happen. Um, we actually started in the bottom corner with our institutional subscribers. These are the institutions who buy direct through the society. Because we have that direct relationship with them, it was a fairly easy message to get out. Some of them have taken it up. It's been great. However, most of our business does come through agents. And given that this used to be the, uh, the ASA meeting, I feel this is an appropriate place to say, EBSCO alone was responsible for half of our subscription business in 2018. We cannot set up an, a deal, a package, that can't be sold by agencies. It just doesn't work for us. So we had very extensive conversations with EBSCO, with Harasovitz, with LM, with USACO in Japan, all of the agents that we work with, to make sure that the publish and read deal we had set up would work for them. 
And they said, you know what? It's great. It's really simple. There's no special pricing. There's no negotiation. There's no special terms. As far as we're concerned, it's just another package. And that has proven true. They have had no issues whatsoever getting the message out about Publish and Read to their direct purchasers. And at the same time, we finally, finally had a foot in the door with the consortia, which makes me really happy, as you can see. Um, initially, we were working with JISC. And we started negotiations for a consortium variant of Publish and Read with JISC in December 2018 and went round and round and round and round and round in many circles until we finally reached agreement in September of 2019. And when I say September, like the 29th, um, it's based on exactly the same frictionless model, but we have done bespoke pricing based on historic spend. And when I say historic spend, subscriptions plus APCs. And it's the APCs that we can directly attribute to the institution, not the APCs that researchers themselves have been paying out of pocket. So, with that model in place, speaking to call in Australia and New Zealand was much simpler and it took three weeks. Um, so, where are we now? With all of our three different uh, units of, of customer engagement in place, we had 57 institutions signed up by the end of January. My original modeling that was approved by the trustees was that we expected between 15 and 20 signups in 2020 with an absolute maximum in our wildest dreams of 50. And we've blown that out of the water and more are still coming in, which is fantastic. So, to give you a bit of an idea of what those 57 signups do, I'm going to show you the proportion of open access in our journals. So, as things stand right now, a third of our portfolio is pure play open access. That's these two, five and six at the end. Across the four other journals, the hybrid journals, the proportion of open access varies from one and a half percent to just a smidge over 21%. That's averaging 13% open access across the entire Microbiology Society portfolio. 13% is nothing to sniff at, but I do need to highlight that 13% open access does not mean 13% of our revenue. Open access, in fact, accounted for just 7% of our revenue in each of the years 2015 through 2019. So, with our 57 institutions coming in, now I need to check if this actually worked properly. Yeah. Um, adding in the 57 institutions pushes Journal 4 which doesn't like open access very much, from 1.5% to 2.5%. Not a great deal of movement. Um, and Journal 2 shifts from 21% to 27%. A bit more movement. But that's just 57 institutions. There are 1,500 others represented across our corresponding author base. Again, this is the period 2016 through 2019. What I can tell you is that in the six weeks of 2020 so far, the 57 institutions that have signed up have collectively seen 10 articles accepted, five of which were in hybrid journals where the authors had explicitly said they weren't interested in open access. They've also had 20 fresh submissions, all of which name-checked, or a good number of which name-checked the publish and read deal as part of their cover letter, saying that they were excited about it. 16 of those 20 submissions were to hybrid journals, and on at least four of the cover letters, I noticed the authors saying, I wouldn't have bothered with OA if it wasn't free. I don't think the librarians are particularly thrilled about the fact that the researchers think it's free, but we'll, we'll go with it. So what about the longer term? Our initial projections were that our least open access friendly journal would still be at under 5% in 2024. I don't think we're going to see a great deal of movement in that one, but journals one and two are likely to exceed 40% open access 
by the end of 2024 if the modelling pans out. And this is quite conservative modelling. And in that year, the portfolio as a whole would have gone from 13 to 50% open access. That's a pretty major amount of progress in five years. Now, let's think 40%, 50% or more open access in a single journal. What does that mean for the institutions who have not moved to publish and read and who have decided to retain their subscriptions? For the moment, we are assuming that we, like most publishers, will remain in a mixed economy. We are not intending to force anyone to move to publish and read. It is there as a supplement or as an alternative to the digital subscriptions and the APCs that are available, have been available for years. We need to stay in this mixed economy because there is a lack of consensus among institutions and among funders around the world on the subject of open access and because our imperative is to publish the best research in the fields in which we operate, regardless of provenance, regardless of the author's ability to pay for that publishing. An overnight flip to a radically different model is just a huge risk to those drivers of publishing the right research. So, we're thinking about a continuum of business models. Publish and read is a means to an end. It lets us flip an institution, or if we're lucky, an entire geographic region from subscription to open without increasing their overall costs. And it allows us to increase the proportion of open access content in our journals. Once a journal reaches majority OA, and please note majority, not plurality, which we can see happening in the next five years, we do then need a model for flipping. There's loads. There are loads of models out there that hypothetically would let us flip our journals. One of the most common is APCs or article transactions. You're all familiar with those. But that kind of transactional approach could be extended there's the question that was raised in Scholarly Kitchen a couple of times about submission fees. Could we charge submission fees and offset that against the final APC? Microbiologists, I can tell you now, do not like submission fees. I broached the subject with some of them last year, and uh, it took a good half hour before they stopped frothing at the mouth. Don't quote me. There's also the option of prepay. Um, it's related to the transactional models, but would mean that the individual researchers themselves would not be paying the submission fees. It would come out of an institutional fund. Similarly, the fund could pay for the article processing charges. There are other transformative models. The reason that we called ours Publish and Read is because we haven't got any caps. All the read and publish deals that we've seen out there have a certain number of APCs or a certain number of articles that the authors from the institution are permitted to publish. There are models out there like the one at the California Dig Digital Library, excellent, um, which splits the cost between the authors and the library. And of course, there are models that uh, Alicia and Lorraine referred to as choreographed flips, like Scope 3, um, which requires an awful lot of infrastructure that we simply don't have at the moment. And there's subscribe to open, which is something that we are monitoring really carefully and which is of great interest to us. It seems to offer, on the surface, similar financial stability to our publish and read model. Um, there's quite a lot of groups attempting it, so there's Knowledge Unlatched, there's Bergen, there's Annual Reviews. If an essentially, what this allows is for libraries to pledge to maintain their subscription, but the full content of the journal becomes OA, regardless of uh, its origin. So, this is purely for illustrative purposes. I make no commitments to this being the actual flow that we will follow. So don't come to me in 2026 and say, you said it ain't going to happen. So, having said that we could see a journal reaching majority OA in 2024, we mapped out what the process might look like for flipping. So, journal publishes 50% or more open access in the full year. 
we have to monitor the full year. We can't say in July we think this journal is going to do 50% OA this year. We have to wait for the full year. That would count as the trigger. The year after the trigger would be a planning year. We would need to go back and review all of the models that are on offer. We would need to assess them. We would need to financially model them. And then those that seemed viable, we would need to go to the market and say, what do you think? Does this work for you as an institution in Australia, as an institution in Kenya, as an institution in Canada, wherever you might be? And then, because we're a society, we would need to get trustee approval before rolling this out. We're sort of thinking, that's probably at least seven months of work, but we would do that. We would aim to have it ready so that when renewal season rolls around, we could go to the market and say, we're going to flip in 2026 or whatever year three happens to be. That's the goal. We don't know if it will happen like this, but that's the goal. So the next time somebody says to you, if you hit 50% OA, you need to flip, it doesn't happen overnight. And then because I know that I was standing between you and lunch, I thought I would finish with some happy noises. These are some of the comments from our very first Publish and Read authors. Um, the capitals on this is brilliant, are quite deliberate. That is how the email came to me. Uh, our very first author said, this is fantastic news that we can publish open access in the Microbiology Society for free. Thank you. That author also emailed her librarian to say thank you, which we are encouraging everybody to do because we want the librarians to know that researchers value this. And uh, this one down in the corner is from Helen Brown, who is one of our early career researchers, and she's also one of the editor mentees on our newest open access journal, Access Microbiology. And her biggest concern as an early career researcher are all of her side projects that she has been doing and can't get published because she wants to publish them open access. Her university requires that she publishes them open access, but there's no funding for publishing them open access. That problem's been removed. She's got one less stress to worry about. And then just for those of you who haven't already read it, um, that's the link to the article that outlines in depth how we did the financial modeling for Publish and Read for standalone institutions. Questions? Anthony, because he's always reliable. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Tasha. Um, Anthony Watkinson, Cyber Research. Have any of the other smaller publishers who you congregate with quite a lot, they're not all that small, but they are smaller, um, have any of them taken up the same sort of deals that you're doing? Is, that, is it a trend? Yeah? So different publishers are operating in different ways. Uh, I know the Biochemical Society have pretty much the same model that we have because Malavika and I spent a lot of time with our heads together in the early part of last year trying to figure out what we could do. Um, there are a lot of different transformative models out there. Uh, IWA Publishing, for example, run a slightly different model. Uh, the Company of Biologists also have a transformative deal in place. The Society Publishers Coalition um, is a, a very informal group of society publishers, unsurprisingly. Uh, we're just about to put out a blog post that identifies the various transformative models that our members have in place. Katrina. Um, I'm wondering to what extent you're having the conversation within the society uh, um, about what sustainability means for a publisher and to what extent the um, um, previously justified perhaps print distribution was, was supporting the, the rest of the society activities. Um, and are you able to engage uh, researchers and other uh, members of the academy um, from all over the world in that discussion? Or um, I, I'd love your thoughts on that. Uh, I'm going to start by saying that print was actually a loss maker for us. Um, when I started at the society in 2017, I looked at how much 
revenue and cost was associated with print versus digital. And uh, on one particular journal, every print subscription was costing us an extra £700 because of the costs of print, ship, maintenance, warehousing, but also print fraud. Um, so we don't offer print. We haven't offered print for several years. On the subject of sustainability, we spend a lot of time talking to our members about sustainability, both financial and non-financial. Um, it's actually one of our three strategic objectives is the long-term sustainability of the society and that explicitly pulls in things like developing future leaders. So the early career microbiologists forum have a lot of weight in the society. They make a lot of decisions or certainly influence a lot of decisions um, and they are very much involved in the conversation about financial sustainability and in particular financial uh, aspects of publishing you can check in our annual reports, which are freely available, obviously, but journals publishing is between 75 and 80% of the society's total revenue, and it does subsidise our grants and our professional development and all of the other activities we do. So we know that we need to justify that, but we also know that we can't pull the rug out from underneath these 5,000 people overnight. So we need to find ways to, to manage that change. There was a question at the back corner, and then I think there's another one in the other back corner, which might be Alicia, but let's start over here. Um, Sabine Hossenfelder from the Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. I was wondering if you accept papers that are available on preprint servers, and um, if you think that the existence of these servers affects the enthusiasm that researchers bring to open access? We love preprints. Uh, we actually published an editorial about, in, it's called In Praise of Preprints. Uh, we are all in favor. Uh, what we have seen is that generally the authors who are keen on preprints are also keen on open access for their version of record. Um, but where they are unfunded, they do tend to opt for preprints because at least a version of their article is made openly available. Uh, one of the things that we get as a comment quite frequently is that many researchers value the fact that we make all articles free to read 12 months after publication, even if they were originally published behind a paywall, which is sometimes very misleadingly called bronze open access. Um, Alicia. Tasha, it's brilliant to start hearing now about the outcomes of the terrific work you've been doing over the last 18 months, 24 months, and the, the leadership in this area is really um, helpful for us all. So I've got a question for you now that you're thinking about the possible flipping sequence over three years. Um, you said that a majority of articles needed to be OA to trigger that process. Is that 50.1% of articles, 75%, 95%? Are you trying to figure that out? We're trying and how to do figure you get that there? out. Okay. I, don't, I can't give you an absolute fixed number. Apart from anything else, publishing doesn't work like that. So we might have 15% you know, one year and then 50% the next year and back to 38 the following year. So we don't quite know exactly how we're going to work this out. Um, as an example, our offsetting policy is based over a rolling three-year average, so maybe we have to look in, in that way to ensure sustainability. We just don't know yet. I'm feeling a bit blind. Is there Chris at the front? And then Chris first, and then Mark. Uh, Chris Banks from Imperial College, London. Um, one of your 57 uh, very happy subscribers, um, not least because for all the reasons that you say about the workload your end in moving to a, 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 a model where each and every article has to be accounted for in some way, we, that reflects back in our institution. That wasn't going to be my question though. Um, you've alluded to some of the, the um, trigger points that are sitting there in plan S, so the 50% and thou shalt flip at 50%, and also 2024, which is the date 
by which Plan S suggests that funders should remove um, their funding for hybrid, your very beautiful, sustainable, simple model um, in every other respect works for libraries, for researchers, and for you as a publisher. But it strikes me that 2024 doesn't work and that 50% 50, 50 may not work either. Um, what are your current thoughts on both of those uh, very hard deadlines? Um, is fear an acceptable response? Uh, I, when the Plan S, uh, when Plan S originally came out and, and through all of their subsequent consultations, we have been quite clear that we do not believe that they are thinking realistically about the global situation. Um, I've alluded to the fact that one of our journals has 18% of its authors based in the Republic of Korea. Unless and until there is a bigger global shift from funders and from institutions towards open access, we can't progress any faster than the researchers will let us go. Um, I'd love to say that wasn't the case, but I, um, I don't operate just in North America and Western Europe. I operate in the whole world, and I need to be pragmatic and not prevent authors from outside of the very privileged areas publishing in our journals. So. I'm kind of going to worry about 2024, maybe in 2022, but the fact that we've managed to get some transformative deals off the ground, I think, stands us in better stead than if we were holding back to see what other people were doing. And then I know there was a question from Mark at the back. Yeah, Mark Carden from Researcher to Reader, I guess. Um, I'm, I'm, firstly, it's very fair that you're getting all the questions because this is a great session. Um, I was looking at the researcher feedback, which was all great and positive and nice, but it was slightly concerning that it's, you know, it's a perpetuating again the idea that publishing doesn't cost anything. Um, what are you doing to remind people that there are costs, it's just that you're moving them around? Yeah, we don't call it free. Explicitly, um, nobody at the society is allowed to refer to this as free open access. We're calling it fee free and we keep putting across the message to every author that this has been funded by their library. We ask them to say thank you to their librarian and we have a, a, a bit of metadata associated with every article indicating which publish and read deal is funding this particular open access article. Um, there is a, a real question about educating uh, researchers about how this is worked, um, but we try our best to make sure that it is clear that this is not free, publishing costs money, uh, and again, this is something that, happened, that, that comes up in, in this article. Our average cost per published article is a thousand pounds. We are trying to bring that down and make it more viable in the long term, but publishing isn't free. It costs money. I would love for it to cost less than a thousand pounds per published article, but the fact is, it doesn't. For us, we don't have the economies of scale that the big players can, can achieve. Do I have time for any more or can I stop? Okay. Please, can we go for lunch and not have more questions? <laughs> Excellent. I'm taking that as get out of jail free. Great. Thank you so much, Tasha, for that wonderful presentation, and of course, Solomon for his presentation before that. Um, so, perfect timing. Uh, we're just about to break for lunch. Um, uh, just a, a mention for Ingenta on your desk there. There's a lovely leaflet from Ingenta, so please do have a look at that. Um, we're grateful for their support. Um, we're now going to break for lunch. We're back here promptly at 1.50. Uh, for the grand debate, so don't be late for that because that's fabulous and it starts with some audience participation, so don't be late. Enjoy your lunch. See you back here shortly. Thank you. Mm -hmm.